The Isle of Wight is the largest island in all of England. Nestled in the English Channel, only two miles offshore from Hampshire, it enjoys a reputation of a tourist destination renowned for its picturesque scenery from the beaches along its coast to the pastoral fields strewn throughout the island's interior. The Isle of Wight has also seen its share of UFO activity over the years. Few incidents, however, can match the curious events that played out in early spring of 1973 when two young children had found themselves entertained by this sponsored ad goes out there to all the fellows watching my channel. If you guys want something nice to gift for the lady, well, I got something special just for you. Introducing Scentbird. What is Scentbird? Scentbird is a subscription-based fragrance service that sends you new scents every single month. Now, this is the perfect gift if you're special someone really enjoys perfumes and fragrances, but how does it work? Simple. Simply pick a scent and choose what you'd like to try from their best sellers. You will also gain access to their full catalog after subscribing. And once you have an active subscription, you will be sent the 8 milliliter bottle of your choice directly to your door. Your first bottle will come in a neat little package, just like this one. This little guy holds roughly about 140 sprays, which, unless you're a French whore, should last well until your next order. So what's really cool is they sent me actually three of these. I'm not able to hold up all three. And you push it like this. And they're all these really cool different colors. So how it works is you simply just twist it. It pops up and you can actually pull the scent out. Now this one is called book. I don't know what book means, but actually it kind of reminds me of a really high end cologne. You got this one, which is a little bit darker. Same thing. This one's called well played. Same thing. Kind of smells more like a cologne than it does perfume. And then of course you have the most fanciest one throne. Pretty cool. Now, I'm not really a fragrance, perfume, or cologne guy, but to me, this feels and seems like a pretty high-quality product, and if you're somebody who likes fragrances and colognes, this seems like a pretty slamming deal. What I also like, and what's nice, is these aren't just for the ladies, because some of these scents here smell like high-end cologne for us fellas that want to smell and seem attractive. So, if this is something that totally wets your whistle, be sure to go ahead and click the link below in the description and use the code WLB55 to get 50 55% off your first month of Scentbird. A garish creature in a swampy meadow. In the decades since, Sam the Sandown Clown, sometimes shortened to Sandown Sam, has remained one of the most peculiar encounters in paranormal literature. The witnesses consisted of an unnamed boy and a girl who would later be given the pseudonym of Faye. Both were around seven years old at the time of their encounter. The children had been walking late one Tuesday afternoon in May near Lake Common. Sand down when their conversation was interrupted by the strangest noise they'd ever heard. It resembled a long, piercing wail, almost like an ambulance siren, yet somehow different. It seemed to beckon to them, always on the lookout for an adventure. The pair set to find its source. Their journey took them across the adjacent golf course, through the hedge on its border, and into a swampy meadow. From this vantage point, the children could tell that they were in the vicinity of the sleepy Sandown Airport. Perhaps the siren was coming from there. As they stepped into the meadow, the sound had abruptly ceased. Even though they could no longer follow the noise, Faye and the boy decided to explore the meadow. After all, it wasn't too remote. And at some point, someone had constructed a short wooden footbridge that traversed a narrow brook cutting across the meadow. As they passed over the bridge, a hand wearing a blue glove popped out from underneath. This alarming appendage was a prelude to the bizarre figure which then followed. Though they couldn't make out many details at this point, both children could tell that the being was immense, standing over seven feet tall and was clearly shaped like a man. Before they could react, the figure nervously fumbled with a book and clumsily dropped it into the water below. It splashed around to retrieve it, then, taking off across the meadow, moving in an absurd hopping gait with its knees raised high. And within moments, the being had retreated into a nearby metallic hut, similar to those found at construction sites, yet lacking any windows. The bizarre nature of this incident seemed lost upon the fay and the boy. The children instead continued to ramble across the landscape. 
After they had walked another 50 yards, they noticed that the creature had reappeared beside the hut. In the distance, they could see that it now held some sort of device in its hands resembling a microphone with black knobs and a white cord trailing from the end. The wailing sound they had initially noticed returned once again in full force, so loud that for the first time, the children felt a surge of fear rushing through them. The boy turned to flee, and as he did so, the creature spoke into this device, the microphone, but instead of being projected from afar, its voice appeared right beside the children, as if it were standing next to them. The voice had asked, hello, are you still there? The tone was friendly enough that Faye and the boy stopped their escape and turned to face the being. Curiosity had gotten the best of them, doling any sense of caution they might have felt. Now, instead of running away, they went to close the distance between themselves and the curious figure. At last, the children were afforded a better view of their visitor. He was just as tall as they had noticed earlier, but more details came into focus as they drew near. Whatever this thing was, the thing was dressed in a green tunic with a red collar and a pair of white pants. The sleeves and legs were affixed with what appeared to be wooden slats. The blue gloves were still very visible, but the children can now tell that the being had only three fingers. This matched its bare feet, which themselves sported only three toes each. These peculiarities paled in comparison to the figure's head, however, which sat directly upon its shoulders. There was no visible neck, the face was large, round, and white, while its other features were comically simple, almost like a child's drawing or the head on a jack-in-the-box. Its eyes were simple triangles, its nose a plain brown square, and a pair of yellow lips were all that constituted a mouth. Whenever the being spoke throughout the entire encounter, these lips never seemed to move. To complete the childish facade, each cheek was topped by a rosy red circle with a red fringe of hair visible underneath a yellow hood, which seemed to be attached to the tunic. From this hood sprouted a black knob of some sort of a pair of antennae, which seemed to be made out of wood. The being produced a notebook, perhaps the same item that it had dropped in the brook earlier, and scrawled upon it a series of words before turning it around to face the children. The sentence was arranged in a nonsensical order, as the being pointed to each word, Faye dutifully read them back to the being. Hello, and I am all colors, Sam. After this bizarre introduction, Sam started speaking once again, this time without the aid of his microphone. His voice was something between a slur and a mumble. The first thing the children had asked was why his clothes seemed so tattered and torn. Sam responded that these were the only articles of clothing that he had owned. They then asked if he was a man, and the response came quickly, and indecisively with a slight chuckle. No, Sam had answered. Well, if he wasn't a man, then what was he? Faye and the boy decided that maybe he was a spirit. They then asked Sam if he was a ghost. Well, not really, but I am in an odd sort of way, he replied cryptically. Faye and the boy were not satisfied by this vague answer. What are you then? They had asked. Yet again, Sam's explanation was less than helpful. You know, he responded without much more elaboration. Instead, he began discussing other aspects of his identity. Despite having identified himself as Sam, he being revealed that in reality, he had no name. However, he was not unique. Sam claimed that there existed others like him and quickly sketched a rough picture of other members of his race in his notebook. They, like him, were frightened of human beings, who they were worried might attack them. If humans chose to harm Sam's people, they would have no way to fight back, he claimed. That was when Sam invited Faye and the boy into his hut. When retelling the story, it seems shocking that Faye and the boy would accept such an invitation. Certainly, any of us would be more than a little skeptical of Sam the Sandown Clown, Underneath his child-friendly veneer lurks the suggestion of something more sinister. We can only guess why the boy seemed so willing. Perhaps it was peer pressure from his companion. In Faye's case, however, she was arguably no stranger to paranormal phenomena. In fact, her family may have been engaged in contact with the beyond for quite some time. Faye's father told researchers from Bufora 
the British UFO Research Association that he had begun seeing strange things in the sky about three years before Faye's encounter with Sandown Sam. And on Tuesday, October 20th, 1970, he himself had embarked upon a journey to the seaside town of Ryde. Along the way, he planned on dropping by a friend's house in Seaview. After departing in Shanklin around 7 in the evening, his route took him through the village of Braiding, where he turned right towards St. Helens. That was when Fay's father first saw it, a massive aircraft coasting low above the swamp. The sight alone had caused him to stop his car so he could get a better look, and as he watched, the craft drifted aimlessly above the river Yar, revealing a circular ring of bright cherry red lights interspersed with hues of turquoise and white. It remained silent the entire time. Now eventually, Fay's father decided to continue on his trip, and as he did so, the craft seemed to pace him parallel to his car. It finally broke off as he reached the outskirts of St. Helens, dropping low above the hedges about 300 yards behind him. Several of the red lights extinguished. Again, Faye's father stopped his car, and this time he grabbed a flashlight. For around 10 minutes, he shone it in the direction of the craft, attempting to communicate with it. In response, the aerial shape bobbed back and forth as if unsettled. Faye's father once more started his car, continuing to town of Seaview. However, when he reached his friend's home, the UFO appeared behind him yet again. Faye's father sat in his car watching the shape in the distance until his friend eventually stepped outside to greet him. In doing so, his friend also saw the strange thing haunting the sky, bobbing up and down below the tree line as if playing hide and seek. The final leg of Faye's father's journey to the village of Ride was uneventful, the red lights passing from view once and for all that night. And for nearly 18 months, Faye's father intermittently encountered solitary red balls of light in the sky. These would either hang motionless or would follow his movements across the Isle of Wight. On March 1st, 1972, he experienced his next dramatic encounter. It was sometime between 9 and 10 at night. Faye's father had been on the beach near Compton Bay when a sudden tidal surge sent him scurrying up the cliffside. The abrupt change in the seascape had been accompanied by a droning sound which, which seemed to originate from beneath the surface of the ocean. As he sat on the shore watching the waves, Faye's father eventually caught sight of two yellow points of light just offshore. He would later tell before investigators that they were peering up at him like the eyes of some horrible sea monster. Both could have not been more than 40 feet away, and they lingered right at the surface of the water like a submarine's periscope. After a time, both lights then disappeared and the tide rolled back out to sea to the level it had been previously. Faye's father, mildly disturbed, decided to then return home. It's worth noting that he never shared these experiences with his daughter, and this would seem to preclude the possibility that his sightings influenced her story with Sam the Sandown Clown, at least if he is telling the truth. To see a UFO is rare, to see one twice rarer still, and to have your child meet a being from another world seems orders of magnitude rarer. What could account for this startling series of events? In the earliest years of their discipline, ufologists ascribed the notion that seeing a flying saucer was a once-in-a-lifetime occurrence. Seeing a UFO was entirely the product of chance, a roll of the dice that caused you to glance into the sky at the right time in the right place. This bias was reinforced by early UFO contactees of the 1950s and 60s who would often share fantastic stories about repeated, sustained contact with beings from other worlds, including off-world travels and their flying saucers. Simply put, they sounded like tall tales. Such ideas were anathema to early UFOlogists with a scientific mindset who were desperate to have their area of interest recognized and taken seriously by the mainstream. Therefore, anyone who saw a UFO on numerous occasions was derided as a repeater. Repeaters were generally regarded as the least reliable eyewitnesses. At best, repeaters were prone to flights of fancy and misidentification of mundane aircraft. At worst, repeaters were outright liars and hoaxers. All this changed, though, once researchers began collecting alien abductions in the 1970s and 80s. 
UFOlogists were faced with individuals who seemed to experience ongoing contact with UFOs and their occupants, often beginning in childhood and persisting through their adult years. The stigma, once leveled against repeaters, slowly faded away. Among the UFOlogists ascribing to this new mindset, repeaters were actually slightly more trustworthy than those who reported standalone sightings. In the new nomenclature, repeaters became experiencers, or to borrow a term from near-death experience researcher Kenneth Ring, experience-prone personalities. This dramatic shift in thinking opened up new avenues of research and paved the way for ufologists to acknowledge the undeniable connections between UFO contact and other anomalies like cryptid sightings, near-death experiences, and general high strangeness like synchronicities. What's more, ufologists also finally acknowledged that this affinity for experiencing the unknown seemed to stretch across successive generations. In short, they realize that if your parents have been abducted by aliens, you yourself are more likely to experience an alien abduction as well. Numerous reasons have been proposed why this takes place. Those ascribing to the extraterrestrial hypothesis believe that aliens select certain bloodlines that are best suited for combination with their own DNA, facilitating the production of human-alien hybrids. Other researchers, more interested in the metaphysical nature behind alien abductions, point to the long-standing belief that gifts like clairvoyance and second sight are hereditary. Either way, UFOlogy's acceptance of both repeaters and the hereditary component of UFO contact helps shed some light on the events of the Isle of Wight in the early 1970s. Faye's father clearly seems to be a repeater. Faye herself seems to have inherited this affinity. This may be why she chose to fearlessly follow Sam the Sandown Clown into this hut that Tuesday in May of 1973. Both Faye and her friend had followed in Sam's footsteps as he approached the hut. As mentioned earlier, the outside did not appear out of place at all. It resembled any temporary structure that you might find serving as an office at a construction site. Artistic depictions from Faye's testimony seem to indicate that the exterior may have even been composed of unassuming corrugated metal, a staple in such structures. The only thing that anyone would find odd was the distinct lack of windows, but plenty of service sheds lack these as well. In any case, Faye and the boy entered the hut through a flap, which was low enough that it forced them to crawl rather than walk inside. And once their eyes had adjusted to the light, they could tell that the hut actually had two stories. The lower level seemed downright cozy, its walls covered in blue-green material resembling wallpaper. A simple wooden furniture sat around an electric heater. The only thing especially technological were the patterns of dials here and there on the interior walls. The second story sat far enough above them that anyone standing on the ground level enjoyed ample headroom. However, this meant that it also appeared much more cramped and seemed to be more metallic than the floor upon which the children stood. Sam made himself at home as he spoke to Faye and her companion, revealing that he subsided predominantly on berries which he gathered in the late afternoon, and water collected and cleansed from the river. Since it was well after 4 p.m. at this point, maybe this is what he had been doing when the children had stumbled upon him by the bridge. Sam, the Sandown Clown, further explained that his little hut was merely an outpost. Another camp of his could be found on the British mainland across the channel. At this point, he removed his hood, revealing a pair of round white ears and a sparse covering of hair, which turned from red to brown further up his scalp. As if to emphasize how much he loved the berries found on the Isle of Wight, Sam decided to perform what Faye described as a conjuring trick for the children. He took one of his berries, placed it in his ear, and jerked his head forward. When he returned upright, the berry had somehow traveled to one of his triangular eyes. Repeating the motion, the berry teleported again, and this time to his mouth. Sam then swallowed his snack. This aspect of the story had been interpreted in various ways. Early reports from the before suggested that Sam, the Sandown Clown, was actually wearing some kind of protective mask and analyzing the berry to check it wasn't poisonous, in their words. More recently, Zalia Edgar, host of the YouTube channel Just Another Tinfoil Hat, had this to offer. 
Sandown Sam's conjuring trick of tossing the berry around his noggin is reminiscent of UFO accounts where other related entities or even the men in black perform small yet impressive feats of magic as though to prove that they are every bit as inhuman as they claim to be. In addition to that, the inclusion of a berry in such a prominent way is odd to me because of their connections to the fairy faith. There are numerous taboos throughout the Celtic fairy faith regarding picking berries at certain times of years or in certain places. The siren-like sound associated with Sam also calls to mind the otherworldly music of the good folk, often compared to the piping noise. Oddly enough, berry picking makes its random appearance in the missing 4 in 1 works of David Politis making me wonder if the two children had stayed longer in the cozy wallpapered hut, they may never have turned up again. Now, after his magic trick was complete, Sam the Sandown Clown chatted with Faye and the boy for around a half an hour or longer, and unfortunately, the details of this conversation have never been made public. At some point, however, all parties decided to draw the visit to a close, and Sam bade the children goodbye, Energized by their interaction, Faye and the boys set off back across the meadow and over the golf links to find someone that they could share their story with. They had met a man, not a strange bobble-headed jack-in-the-box man, but an actual flesh-and-blood human and told him they had just met a ghost. He simply laughed at them, but his dismissal had no effect on the strength of their own conviction. Both knew that they had spent the afternoon with something beyond the ordinary. Around two months had passed before Faye shared her encounter with her own father. And on June 2nd, 1973, she told him all about the peculiar, popping man she had met near the airport. Despite his own encounters, he refused to believe her at first. Once he saw how hurt she was by her father's dismissal, Faye's father changed his mind. He spoke only briefly with her friend, who seemed largely unwilling to share what had happened that day, beyond the fact that her story was true. Faye's father eventually shared both her and his experience with investigators from Bufora, the premier British UFO group at the time. No sign of the mysterious metallic hut was found in the swampy meadow beside the airport, leading to the speculation that it had not been a structure at all, but rather a vehicle, perhaps a landed spaceship from an alien race. Bufora investigators who heard Faye's tale were impressed by the number of details that she had conveyed, especially for a child. Investigators entertained the possibility of an overactive imagination, a shared hallucination, or even a hoax perpetrated by a third party. Each explanation seemed to fall short of satisfactory. However, leaving everyone before us scratching their heads, what had these children met that day? Well, there really isn't a great fit for exactly what the Sam the Sandown clown may have been. The story was quickly picked up by UFOologists and folded into the catalog of UFO sightings, but aside from her father's experiences and the hut's disappearance, little else suggests he was an extraterrestrial. As Zelia Edgar noted, there are few parallels to fairy folklore, which represents an important part of the cultural heritage found in this part of the world. Berries are central to both fairy tradition and the Sandown Sam story. Fairies interacted more readily with children, just like Sam. To varying degrees, they, like Sam's description of his own people, feared human beings, yet existed invisibly alongside our own world. Finally, like Sam the Sandown Clown's vanishing hut, the ability of fairy dwellings to blink in and out of existence is well attested in stories all around from Ireland and the British Isles. For example, a tale of County Longford in Ireland tells about a farmer named O'Brien who was driving his cattle near one of the country's many ancient ring forts, which are commonly regarded as fairy dwellings according to this day. Now, according to the tale, O'Brien spotted one of the fairies emerging from the ring fort with a sack of treasure in its hand. Spotting him, the being laughed at him and took off into the darkness, and O'Brien gave pursuit. The fairy and its treasure eluded him. When he returned to his cattle, he found that one of them had disappeared. O'Brien had enlisted the help of a priest, desperately begging him to relocate his lost cow. The priest arrived at the ring fort and dispelled the fairy magic. At the same time the cow was returned, the ring fort just blinked out of existence, just like Sam's hut. Interestingly enough, beings resembling Sandown Sam have been encountered elsewhere. In fact, similar creatures were seen that same year. Over 4,500 miles away, and five months later, 
two men in Pascagoula, Mississippi, would experience one of the most famous alien abductions of all time on October 11th, 1973. Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker had decided to pass the autumn evening by fishing near an old shipyard along the Pascagoula River. Eventually, their attention was captured by an ominous buzzing sound. Looking up from the river, they discovered that the noise came from a 30-foot-long football-shaped object drifting through the night sky. Across its sides, which stood around 9 feet tall, they could see windows and a pair of blue lights. The craft descended above a clearing to their rear, and that is when they saw the creatures. While not an exact match, the aliens in Pascagoula abduction nonetheless roughly fit Faye's description of Sam the Sandown Clown. An opening had appeared on the craft, releasing two monsters which floated down by the riverside. Each stood around five feet tall, both lacked a neck, and their facial features seemed overly simplified. Instead of a nose, the aliens displayed a long, pointed appendage, almost resembling a carrot. Identical features sat where their ears should have been. There weren't any obvious eyes, and both had the barest suggestion of a mouth. The feet of both entities were large and rounded like an elephant's, while their arms ended in hands that looked more like mittens or claws rather than human palms. The entire body of each creature was swathed in wrinkled gray skin. With the exception of the infamous 1961 kidnapping of Betty and Barney Hill, the 1973 encounter from Pascagoula is perhaps the most investigated alien abduction in American history. Unlike many other encounters, it also continues to evolve to this day, with Calvin Parker regularly stepping forward to share newly remembered details with researchers, who themselves have uncovered interesting tidbits here and there. The most straightforward and earliest retelling of the Pascagoula abduction finds these creatures paralyzing Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker and seizing them bodily to take them aboard their craft. Once inside, a strange device resembling a gigantic eyeball levitated in their direction, examining them for at least 20 minutes before returning the men to their fishing pier. One of the most remarkable aspects about this abduction is the compelling circumstantial evidence surrounding it. Other people in the area stepped forward to claim that they too had seen the strange lights in the sky on the same night of October 11th, 1973. What's more, Hickson and Parker seemed absolutely genuine. In the immediate aftermath of their abduction, they had sat in their car for 45 minutes debating where to go. They eventually found their way to the local PD, where law enforcement grilled them for two hours. In a sly if deceptive move, police officers left Hickson and Parker alone in the interrogation room, but left their recording running. The hope was that they would reveal their lies to one another in private, discussing how to best corroborate one another's story. However, when law enforcement listened to the recording afterward, they discovered exactly the opposite. Both men remained terrified even when left alone. Their discussion was about how disoriented and baffled they were rather than how to best fashion a tall tale. UFO researcher and author Greg Bishop has often compared the appearance of the Pascagoula aliens to the Hopi Kachinas, a resemblance even more notable in depictions of Sam the Sandown Clown. Indigenous tribes from the American Southwest believe that Kachinas are actually personifications of the natural world that interact with human beings. They can represent just about anything, from the stars to weather to ancestors and animals. To celebrate and honor these spiritual forces, tribes like the Hopi engage in ritualized dances where they dress up in outfits representing their interpretation of the Kachinas. Tribal artisans also produce small effigies known as Kachina dolls. These are often gifted to individuals who will take care of the statues and honor them. Part of their purpose is to familiarize the living with the appearance of actual Kachina beings. There are at least 200 recognized by the Hopi. The appearance of Kachinas, particularly their faces, resemble both Sandown Sam and the Pascagoula aliens to a great degree. Their heads often display various protrusions resembling antennae, and their faces are typically painted on a simple, stylized manner. The fact that the Hopi chose to depict their spirits in this way, coupled with how certain aliens exhibit the same features as well as other supernatural talents, suggests that both ancient indigenous cultures and modern UFO experiencers are interacting with the same intelligence. 
which interpretation is correct. Spirits, extraterrestrials, or somehow both, at the same time, is anyone's guess, and largely depends on one's personal convictions. Returning to Sam the Sandown Clown, Faye's father offered his own assessment of what his daughter and her friend encountered. Speaking with the Bephora representative, he concluded this, I get the impression that Faye was somehow taken into a bubble of alien reality, created by this strange personage. He told them that he had just made the jut. Also, Faye told me that while they were talking to this ghost, two workmen nearby were repairing a post. They paid no attention to the weird charade as though they could not see it. The most frustrating aspect missing from this case is the half hour of conversation with Sam, the Sandown Clown, when he engaged with Faye and the boy. We will never know whether or not Sam shared any more details that might shed light on what he was or from where he had come. Was he an alien? One of the Fey folk? Was he one of the Hopi's Kachinas, displaced by thousands of miles? Or, as the children initially suspected, was Sandown Sam a ghost? All we know for certain is that, from his own mouth, Sam the Sandown Clown was not human. Most importantly, what do you guys think about Sam the Sandown Clown? As always, let me know what you think in the comments below. And if you enjoyed today's video, be sure to go ahead and smack that like button. And also, if you're new to the channel, be sure to go ahead and hit that big ol' red subscribe button for content just like this because I release storytelling of the mysterious and supernatural. As always, guys, I love you all. Keep an open mind, and I'll check you guys out in the next video.